Well, since we're standing, uh, if, if you're able to stand, go ahead and come, uh, rise to your feet. And let's go ahead and go before the Lord. I know we're going to be praying today, but, uh, you know, might as well get this thing started off right. So, Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're available. God, we thank you that you're present. God, we thank you, Lord, that your ears are open to us. And, Father, Lord, we pray that you would sit and rest and stay here with us. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to, in a safe place, read and dive into your word. So, Lord, I pray that as we set the atmosphere, as we set the, uh, the, the table for a time of prayer, Father God, Lord, I pray that needs would be met. God, I pray that hearts would be comforted. I pray, Lord God, that arms would be strengthened. And Lord, today, above all things and all that we do, Father God, in our much or our little, God, that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up in this house. Lord, we thank you. Oh, God, we thank you that the name of Jesus rests, sits, towers over every other name that can be named. So we declare you as Lord over the Rock Church. We declare you as Lord over the Inland Empire, over our situations, families, workplaces, above all things. And Father, we invite you to stay here with us, that your Holy Spirit would teach us as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray these things. And we all say, Amen, amen and Amen. All right, go ahead, grab a seat. Go ahead, grab a seat. Um, Okay, well, tonight we're praying, um, and uh, I don't know, I, I guess, if I want to preach, I might as well be at full disclosure, because um, I, I have a feeling maybe you might feel like I do, is prayer is one of those things where you kind of have a love-hate relationship. Uh, it's got to be one of the hardest, easy things to do. Um, because, uh, come on, I mean, you guys, if, if, if not you, then you know several people that have no problem talking whatsoever. I mean, I, 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 I don't even know how many tens of thousands of words a woman is expected to put out, and a man, probably half of those, uh, every day. But for goodness sakes, talking is one of the easiest things we do. I mean, we, you, you've been doing it ever since you were one, two, three years old. But for some reason, it, when it comes to pointing those words upwards, it just becomes a really difficult thing. I don't know if it's our time. I don't know if it's our attitudes. I don't know if it's just the fact that sometimes we can let the cares of this world creep in as doubt, and we begin to kind of feel like, is anybody listening? Is anybody there? I don't know. I don't know if you've ever said the prayers where you just kind of throw in a Hail Mary out, and you just, it's almost like you could see the words going up in your bedroom, and then they hit the ceiling fan, and they begin to kind of fall down in a pathetic little sad kind of way, and you just think, is, 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 is this even real at times? And there's times where you just find yourself at the bottom of the barrel and you just don't know any other way to go and you just kind of hope, I, I, I pray that this thing lands somewhere. Prayer is one of those things that we can kind of psych ourselves out about. So tonight, let's do this. Tonight, let's pray. But before we do, let's, uh, please allow me to, to encourage you in a way to, 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 to put our faith in the place where it could be most active. Now, I love what Pastor Luke shared today. He said, God doesn't respond to our need because, let's be honest, this world is full of it. And how many needs go unmet? But he responds. God responds to our faith. So if we're going to do this tonight, let's go all in. Let's go big or let's go home. Let's, if we're going to pray tonight, then, 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 then let's have an atmosphere and an attitude of faith that, that, that puts the work out there and expects the good Lord to come and cash in on his word. Let's believe that the promises of God are yes and amen and not maybe and kind of and sort of. Today, let's, let's pray like we mean it. You know, it's funny. Uh, in, 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 in the book of Hebrews, uh, we've been kind of taking a break from it, so I'm having Hebrews withdrawals. Um, so, uh, I mean, you do something for a couple of years, you just kind of got, your, got to get your fix, right? So, uh, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, it's an inter interesting uh, passage, and it's um, one I know that we've gone through before, but I wanted to revisit it because I think it's applicable for what we, what we need to do today. Uh, in Hebrews 10, um, it, it, it refers back to an Old Testament principle. Let's go ahead and read it. Uh, if you guys have it up there, today I want to talk to you about going through the veil and out of the box. Uh, because if we can capture the fullness of this idea, this principle, this thing that God's spoken about, you and me, then we can begin to pray 
with an attitude that begins to see the results that God has so promised us. It says here in Hebrews 10, it says in the New Living Translation, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Now, stop, 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 stop. Before we go any further in the verse. The most holy place. It's, it's begins to speak of heaven's most holy place. Now, when the author of this, bi- of this book in the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this down, he's trying to get us to think of something, the most holy place. Now, this is, this is, this is something that you'll find in the Old Testament. I was a bit tempted to go to Leviticus tonight, but I'm not, I'm not, I, I, not, not, not today, not today. Uh, but it says this, it, it, it speaks of heaven's most holy place because we're, we have access to it, to it because of the blood of Jesus. It continues on with this in mind. It says, now by Jesus' death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain, the veil, into the most holy place. Now we begin to look at these things, a curtain, a veil, we're getting some type of furniture, draperies here, I don't know what they were, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some flowers or little ducks on it, I'm not too sure, maybe seraphim, you know, one of those things. Uh, and he begins to talk about this most holy place again. Now since we have such a great high priest, Old Testament stuff again, what's going on here? Who rules over God's house? The temple, let us go right into the presence of God, sounds good to me, with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So he wraps it up and says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm, for God can be trusted God can be trusted to keep his promise. God can be trusted to keep his promise. That's the gold right there. God can be trusted. God, I I, I don't know who's broken your trust before, but it ain't Jesus, okay? I don't know what happened between you and your father or whatever your life situation is, but I'll tell you this, the name above Jesus is above that, so he supersedes that. He's overarching that. He is able to be trusted with his promise, and it all rests on the previous verses, talking about this holy place, this curtain, this idea that we find in the Old Testament. You see, if you're unaware of this, let me, do, let, me, let me share something with you. If you are aware, then please walk with me as we go over this review. But back in the Old Testament, God had a process of meeting him. God has always wanted to be close to us. Always. Old and New Testament, same person. So in the Old Testament, back before Jesus, there was a process God had set forward. He said, look, we have to have these terms of engagement here. So I'm going to set up this system, the temple system. Now the temple, you know, we're just going to kind of do a quick little breeze through this, just the important parts here for tonight, it was basically a building, a big box, a big square building with two rooms in it. You'd enter the first room, and there's the holy place. The priests would do their thing, their job, the administrations, their prayers, and then on the inside of the holy place, well, as well, if it's better than the holy place, it's the most holy place. It's the holiest. It's the, it's the holy of holies. The inside room. The inner sanctum, if you will. So you go into the second room, and there was this box. Uh, Indiana Jones, remember the Ark of the Covenant? The, the Nazis, the, anyway. <laughs> was, was the innermost room, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And in there was a box, a box called the Ark of the Covenant. And, 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 and it was more than just a box. If you understand it, it was a throne. When the priest came in, God's presence would fall and it rests on the box. It was his throne, which makes sense because if you think about it, Jesus is the king of kings. God is the creator of the universe. If we begin to understand and you put it in that connection, every king needs a throne because it's from the throne that he makes his declarations. It's from the throne that he rules his kingdom. And if he is the king of all kings, well, he needs a throne. So there in his box, there, there in this temple, there in this, 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 this room, God comes and meets with his priest. And that's the way it used to work. And it's there that we can begin to understand. Now in between that inside room, the holy place, and the the, the most holy place, and the holy place, was a curtain, a veil, big, tall, thick. Light couldn't come in or out of it. It just was a separation piece. The priest would squeeze through and meet with God. The problem is this, is God's close, but he's not accessible, right? 
you, you, you know what I'm saying? Gentlemen, if you've ever got an argument with your wife, she's close, but she's not accessible. Like, I see her, but I ain't getting near her. If you value your life, you understand. It's kind of like that with Jesus, with, with God back in the Old Testament, I guess. You know, I see him, but I'm not, you know, not ready yet. He was close, but he was not accessible, which is okay, but not good enough. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was God's throne. And on a throne, the king does specific things. He makes declarations. He makes decisions. This is the way it's going to be. The king's presence sits there where you can speak and communicate. I mean, you remember Esther with the, with the rod and the thing, and she comes and before the Lord and bows and hopes she lives through it. She's before the presence of the king to where she can communicate with him. At the throne, you see his strength. Now, interesting, the Ark of the Covenant only left the building for two reasons. Walk with me here, people. We're almost there. We're almost there. It only left for two reasons. Number one is because, well, it had to move. Back in the time where God had a mobile home, the tabernacle, going around the countryside, well, he had the, 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 the Ark would leave, and they would go to their new place and go where they needed to go. And the other time the Ark left the building was at times of war. The armies would go forth, and when they needed encouragement, strength, when God's presence needed to come to the battle to fight for them, the armies would see the ark, the box, coming, and God's throne approached. The king was coming over the hills. Where does my help come from? Over there in the hills. And it began to come, and God's presence walked onto the field, and he began to fight the battles for them. And they knew when that box was coming, when the throne was coming, so was the king. They understood, too, is wherever the ark sat, that was his. Wherever that box touched that ground, that ground belonged to the God of Israel. There's even a story where the ark ends up at this guy's house. Kind of strange. You wake up one day, didn't see that yesterday. I woke up this morning and... My children had left a stuffed animal in the backyard of a skunk. I spent about 30 minutes trying to decide if I was supposed to go outside or not. Freaked me out. <laughs> nice little surprise. So, I, so this man wakes up outside and looks outside the window and says, Oh, there's a box here. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And that man's house was blessed because the Ark rested there. It owned the land. God owned. His presence rested on there. Now that's fine and dandy, Right? That's Old Testament. We don't need the box. We don't have the box. They can't find the box. It's gone. But that's not a problem. You see, the people were separated by these rooms, by this veil. Now Luke 23 comes, and all of a sudden Jesus, like he so wonderfully does, begins to flip the script. Um, there we have this picture of Jesus on the cross, arms outstretched, blood pouring down. And even in this beaten, marred visage of mangled humanity, Jesus cries out words of victory. It says here in Luke 23, 45 through 47, it says that the sun was darkened and the veil, the veil of the temple was split in two, top to bottom. No, no man could have done this. Top to bottom, the curtain ripped. The earth shook. And Jesus says an interesting words, interesting set of words. He says, it says, Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, Father, into my hands, the veil ripped, I commit my spirit. Yes, yes, yes. Having said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion who saw, his eyes were opened. And he said, surely, certainly this was a righteous man. Walk with me here, folks. We're almost done. We'll wrap it up, wind it down right here. Because uh, it gets a little exciting here. At that moment on the cross, the veil was torn and the spirit left the body of Christ. His spirit went forth through the veil, out the box. You see, God is simply too big to be contained inside of a box. You, you see, Jesus says, what hand? God says, what hands can build me a house? Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. 
Try it. I dare you. You see, God, God, is, God is untamable. God is a God that cannot be, you cannot predict him. You cannot estimate him. You cannot compare him. Or God is a God that simply refuses to be sha- chained or shackled. He is not something you can stuff into a box or make a pretty little picture of him and say, that's Jesus right there on the wall. He cannot be contained by death, but God himself refuses to be stuffed into a box and put boundaries over him. So here Jesus, at the point of death, he shouts out, my spirit is committed to you. His spirit goes forth. The earth breaks. The veil rips. And all of a sudden, the entire situation changes. Now, here's the thing is God's not on the loose now. He's not, because he desires a place to live. And this is where we come in. You see, the Old Testament's just a sneak peek of what's to come. The Bible begins to say after the veil split, 2 Corinthians 6.16, it says, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? God's looking for a safe, clean place, a holy place to live. And he turns around and says, for you, you, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. He says, right now, we are the temple of God. I love what Pastor Deborah says, we're wall to wall, Holy Spirit. So wait, wait, wait a minute now. If the temple of God has a specific structure, if the holy of holies is within the temple of God, if God's throne is found within the depths of the temple, and we now all of a sudden become the temple of the living God, and God desires to dwell within us, then that means that his throne is found within the heart of man, and God sits upon the heart of man, a a, a temple not made by man's hands, but a temple fashioned, custom made by God himself, fearfully, wonderfully made within our mother's womb. Custom made lazy boy for Jesus Christ. Some of you may be a love seat, some of us may be a sofa, some of us may be a director's chair, but a place comfortable made. For Jesus Christ. For the presence of God to rest and dwell. You see, all of a sudden, God is close and accessible. Because he dwells within us. You see, if God's throne is in our heart, then that means when the Spirit of God rests on you, the King makes declarations over your life. You feel, maybe you feel like your words are hitting the ceiling. No, 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 no. They don't even got to go that far. You don't got to worry about it hitting the ceiling. They don't even got to go that far. All you need to do is begin to think and speak forth the words. And God himself, who is close at hand, no, no, no. He rests within the heart of man. All of a sudden, we begin to have an access and a relationship to the living God, the creator of the universe, the one from the very beginning of time, spoke these things into existence today, knows your situation intimately. And when the king sits on the throne, he begins to make declarations out of his mouth. He begins to declare life and not death. He begins to declare the year of the Lord's favor and not his curse. He begins to speak speak peace between you and your enemies. He begins to make decisions. Are you confused? Do you not know what to do or where to go? Then simply enter the king's throne room and you begin to speak to the king and say, King, what are we going to do about this? Because I need answers and I know you have them. Lord, speak as you sit on the throne and declare things over my life. The king sits on the throne. His presence is there. In your loneliest times, God is there. You may not feel it, but he's there. You may not feel it, but he's there. You may not feel it, but he's there. He's not far, he's close. So close, he rests within the heart of man. His presence is that light to guide the way. His promise is trustworthy. And when the Ark of the Covenant came over the hill, the Lord's strength went forth and fought the battle. When you are weak, God's throne goes with you everywhere you go. I would venture to say the help comes over the hill because you're walking over the hill. 
I, I, I would venture to say that, that his strength is just on that reserve tank waiting for you to flip the switch and he'll just put the, 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 the strength of the Holy Spirit working in and through your veins. I, I would venture to say that you need not look any further than the mirror. Not because you're wonderful. Because look, I know you're nice. I know you're good, but you're not that good. But simply to look in the mirror and say, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not me. It is, a temple can be empty and useless. Oh, but the word of God, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit dwells within me. And when I speak, God responds like a loving father. And wherever that ark went, God owned it. Corinthians tells us, don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? You were bought with a price. Where you go, God goes. Where God goes, he owns that land. He owns that land. What is it possession is nine tenth law? He owns that land. You see, with that idea in mind, and let me wrap this thing up because brother talking too much, we gotta pray. Wherever you go, if God's presence, if his throne, if the king's throne rests there, you are never in the enemy's territory. You are never in the enemy's territory. Because we believe that for Abraham, everywhere you put your foot, so it will belong to you. Everywhere you bring, the kingdom of God rides behind you in full force. So when you're in your truck driving cross country, there you are. You are in the presence of God. You not, you not only are in, but you bring the kingdom of God with you. You are taking ground from the enemy. When you go to your college campus inside of that classroom, now you as a representative of Jesus Christ carrying the presence of God as a temple with the throne room of God in your heart, you all of a sudden have claimed if you're a believer and you have the authority of Christ, Christ, active and alive inside of you, you have claimed that as the kingdom of God within that classroom. Your cubicle is a holy place. Why? Because you've stepped into it and you brought the presence of God. And now you are never in the enemy's territory. Why? Because you are bringing God's kingdom each and every place you go. Wherever you step your foot, if you are carrying the presence of God with you, there you are. You are on home turf and you've got home field advantage. Because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're, an earth, we're, we're, we're a clay pot with the goods inside of us. And when the goods are inside of you, that pot's value skyrockets. Tonight, have you ever felt like your prayers don't go anywhere? Be encouraged. Because they don't got you. They're already there at the feet of Christ. You can speak with the authority that God's placed within you. It's been said this. It's been said this way. Um, that home is where the heart is. Right? Just a house without a heart. Well, home is where the heart is. God's home is where the heart is open. God's home is where the heart is open. Is your heart open? Does God rest, live, dwell within you? It's not a feeling. It's just, it's just a fact. It's a statement. It's a life reality we've got to live in. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we can approach the throne of grace boldly. Interesting, back in Hebrews it says, heaven's most holy place. And then it says, holy place, most holy place without that heaven piece in it. You know, the funny thing is, the throne root of God in the depths of heaven and the throne of God in the depths of your heart are interconnected. And in the heart of a believer is where heaven touches earth. Today, when you pray, you're bringing heaven into the earth around you. Heaven isn't something we live when we die. Heaven is not, a, heaven is not just a future reality. It's a present moment that we can bring God's authority and kingdom we can make wrong right by bringing God's justice into a situation. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Make a brother want to pray. Whew. Tonight, let's do this real quick. We're going to pray. But before we do, um, before we do, 
our hearts have been designed to enthrone something, someone. The question is, who's sitting on your throne? God's desire is to be close. But God doesn't go where he's not invited when it comes to the heart of man. Where do you stand with God? Is, you, is your throne empty? Or better yet, have you placed somebody, something in that throne instead? Today, where do you stand with God? You know, a lot of people think they're okay with God when they're not. So sit tight, and I want you to begin to take stock. Ask yourself a couple questions tonight. Where do you stand with God? Are you dead or alive within your heart? Is God in you, or is he still far off? Are you living this, or is this just an idea, something you learned in Sunday school, catechism, Sabbath school many years ago? Because you see, these things don't apply to a person that has not yet made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of their life. Let me ask it this way, because this is an easy way to kind of figure things out. If this was your last day on earth and you just were done, consider this. Where would you spend your forever, heaven or hell? It's an easy way to figure it out. Pastor Richard, I think I'd go to heaven. Well, why? Well, I don't know, because I'm good. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Hey, that's great, but that's not the way it works. Like, if you were to look in the Bible, cover to cover, know where you find Old or New Testament that good people make it. You'll, what, here's what you will find, though, is that all of us will never be good enough. Because that's not what it takes. It's not good enough. So good's not going to cut it. It's not what God's looking for. But Pastor Richard, I'm in church. I'm in church on a Sunday night at a prayer meeting. Your butt in a chair, singing a song, listening to some short Mexican guy is not going to get you to heaven. I appreciate it. But it's not going to get you there. Because coming to church don't make Christians. Just like eating at McDonald's ain't going to get you a job there. It's just going to make you a little greasy. So if you're in this place today, I'm going to tell you, all your hours in church are not going to get you there. They're not going to make you a Christian. But Pastor Richard, I believe in God. I, I'm a spiritual person. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not in any other religion. Or, you know, I, I worship God, a God, the God. I don't know. He's out there somewhere. I live a good life. Doesn't that count for something? Hey, that's great. But look... Your mental ascension is not going to cut it. See, I, God's not looking for what you know. It's about who you know. I, I know about the president. I, I've heard his speeches. I've seen him on TV. Know his first, middle, last name. Saw his kids, his family. I could probably even find out where he's traveling next week. But that doesn't mean I know him. It just means I know about him. And a lot of us in this place have a relationship with God where we know about him, but we don't know him. And that's not being close to God. That's not having a relationship with him. That doesn't mean he's Lord of all. That just means that you've memorized a couple things. So tonight, let's give God what he's been looking for. And from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, you'll find this, that God has been after one thing, and that's everything. If you were to read this, you'd find that. So if you're in this place and you have not given God himself, Jesus Christ, all of your heart and all of your life, you're not going to make it. But you can. Turn that all around with one decision to say, I do, to Jesus Christ. If you're in this place and you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you're in this place and maybe you thought one of those other things we've discussed today would get you right with God. Today, now you know. And the only thing that will get you there is by being born again. Giving all your heart, all your life to God. Tonight, he doesn't want some, most, or a lot. He wants all. So from the front to back to side to side, if you're in this place, you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ today. If you're in this place, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to make one decision to change your life. No, no, no. Your eternity. And all you have to do is choose today to give all your heart and all your life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you on a count of three. I'm going to go one, two, three, it's like that. And if you're in this place and you need to get right with God, if you've been running from him instead of to him. Hey, if you're in this place and you've never done this before, you're not too sure. You're just, you're, maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, maybe should I, uh, is this, is he talking to me? Yes, yes, I am talking to you. And I'm asking you today to raise your hand as a way of saying that I need to give God all my heart, all my life. I want to go to heaven. I want to live what you're talking about today. I want God to go with me wherever I go because I'm empty and I need him to sit on the throne. So if that's you in this place, all across this room, front to back, side to side, if you need to give your heart to God, I'm going to count to three right now. I want you to get your hand up, get it right back down, and we will do it the Bible way. We'll pray, and you will be saying yes to Jesus Christ. Change your life, change your world, and he will begin to fill you, and he'll begin to make your life different than it was before. 
So if that's you in this place, I want you to get your hand right now in this place. Ready? One. If you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ, get your hand. If you've never done this before, get it up. Two. Don't wait for a single person in this room. This is between you and God. Come on. Get your hand up in this place. Ready? Three. Who in this place needs to get right with God today? Who in this place? Where are you at? Over here. Oh, raise it up. I can't, I can't see it. Got you right there, bro. Anybody else? Two over there. One, two over here. Three. Got you right there. Three people in this place. You know you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Over here. I got you right there. You can go put your hand down. Three people need... I've made a decision today to change their life. Three. Who else over here? I got you. I got you right there. Okay, who else in this place? You're not too sure you want to make sure. You don't know. Look, hey, your life is jacked up. This is the answer. If you know you need to change today, this is it. Where you can make your decision to say, God, change me like I've never been changed before. Who else in this place? Three people rose their hand. Three people need to give their heart to Jesus Christ in this place. Or the four. Anybody else in this place? Four. Anybody else in this place? We got to shut this thing down, guys. All right, let's see if we've got a praise. Come on. Yeah. Let's get ready to pray. Well, let me do this. Let me get everybody to stand up real quick. Let me get everybody to stand up real quick. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and I'm going to ask you for it. I got your hands up. Get your stuff. Get your Bible. Get a friend if you need to get a friend. And I want to do this. I want to invite you up here to the front. Come on. If you guys got your hand up or you know you should have, come on. Get your hand up. Come on. I want you to take a bold step right here. We want to get you some free stuff. We want to encourage you, tell you guys what to do next. Come on. Let's give them a big round of applause. Hey, Jesus Christ walked an aisle for you to the top of a hill, spread out his arms to give you his everything. Today, you're doing the same. Come on. If that's you, come on, come on, right up here in the front. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I love it. Good seeing you guys. Oh, I got Pastor Joel here real quick. He just wants to pray with you guys, give you guys some free stuff. We're going to go into some prayer right now. You guys come back and join us. But I want, well, here's what I want to do is I want to encourage you guys. Be encouraged because you're doing a wonderful thing. Best decision you've ever made in your entire life, saying yes to Jesus. Because he's already said yes to you. Can you believe it? He said yes first. So today, Pastor Joel wants to pray with you, wants to give you some free things and tell you guys what the next step is. He wants to give you guys a friend, somebody to help you and move you along, to encourage you and be your cheerleader in life, a friend. So we're going to take a left turn right over here, follow Pastor Joel and his team. And they're going to talk with you just for a second. You come right back out. Come on, let's give a big round of applause.